Welcome to the second lecture on Huck Finn, and in this we'll mostly focus on the middle section of the novel. As you recall from the first lecture, the first third of this novel was written by Mark Twain in the mid-1870s as he was considering how the elements of realism had the ability to remake American literature. During that period of his life, Twain explored how the aesthetic of realism was, in his opinion, vastly superior to the aesthetic of romanticism, because he's focused on these ideas in his personal life. During the 1870s, they show up in his writing more in the early chapters than in the later chapters. Also, as we discussed in that first lecture, Twain is unable to imagine a path forward for his story once he realizes that to allow Huck and Jim to continue south, and therefore into the states, where Jim is in greater jeopardy, is a far more compelling narrative decision than following his original plan in taking Huck and Jim North to the free states. In general, novels work like this. The escalation of tension produces plot, and moving Jim and Huck further into the south will escalate tension. In the novel, this moment comes and the realization for Mark Twain comes after Huck and Jim have missed Cairo and are forced to continue their journey south. After this point, Twain can't clearly see for years where this story will take him. At times he's frustrated, he even considers giving up on the novel. It's only years later, after accepting a magazine assignment from his friend William Dean Howells at The Atlantic, that he sees a way forward with his novel. The magazine assignment takes him back to the Mississippi River, a place he hasn't visited in many years, where he writes a series of essays about the region. It's only then, after he can see with the eyes of an adult the deep social problems and prejudice of the South, that he's able to find a path forward with his novel. One of the central dramatic rubs in this book is this. Huck, who Twain would like to reform to the point where he can see a type of equality and humanity and all, is in the pre-war South, where he is surrounded by prejudice and selfishness. And in this, Twain works on one central narrative question. Where can Huck find a home? But to get back to the main introductory observation, this next set of chapters are written many years after Twain finishes the first third of the book. At this point in his life, in the early 1880s, Twain is still an advocate of realism, but he's no longer a new convert. Some of the expressive fire of his early convictions has drained away from him. He's now thinking about other social themes, and for this reason, the continuous discussion of realism is not part of the middle section of the book in the same way it was in those early chapters. Instead, this section of the novel has two main themes, one of which is somewhat related to the idea of realism. First, Twain still deeply believes that America has not yet been able to find a strong national identity because, at least in the world of the 1840s when the novel is set, America is still looking to the traditions and customs of Europe, England in particular. Americans, in Twain's view at least, want to pretend that they are somehow connected to European society, whereas in Twain's estimation they would do far better to simply embrace the actual world around them, to look at the land their needs, and what it would take to make them happy in the towns where they live, and then to find a path forward in that situation, rather than continually trying to transplant the ideals of Europe into the States. The other large theme has to do with the concept of home. As Huck begins to have his awakening, as he begins to understand that he's nothing like his father, he looks for a new place to call home. It's not that Huck has intentions to remain on the raft indefinitely. Each time he goes ashore, it is with the expectation that this might be a town that he can call home, where the values that he's developing in his inner life now match the values in the geographic society that surround him. He wants the values in the town around him, essentially, to cohere strongly to who he's becoming to be. But here now, let's jump into chapter 17. We'll go back and pick up some of the missing chapters in a little while when we discuss how the novel depicts how racism frames individual worldviews in the novel. But right now, we are moving into a section in which Huck is with the Grangerfords. Again, we often think of this novel as a journey downriver, 
But Huck didn't initially plan to journey to many towns. Rather, his initial aim was to find a new home just far enough away from St. Petersburg, Missouri, so as Pap wouldn't be able to find him. That Huck continually moves downriver is the result of his disappointment. The disappointment he experiences each time he finds a community that doesn't represent the values that he is developing. The middle section begins with Twain again discussing how romanticism is a grotesque representation of actual American life. He will quickly move on from this idea, but it's here in chapter 17, as though Twain hasn't yet shifted to the thematic materials that will define the middle stretch of this novel. In the following passage, Huck Finn looks at an unfinished painting that Emmeline Grangerford was working on at the time of her death, a painting that of course holds the absurdities of romanticism expressed in visual art, or at least that's how Mark Twain views it. The painting that Emmeline was working on is set at a graveyard at night, and again notice tropes that at minimum would be familiar to Edgar Allan Poe, while the figure in the painting was considering taking her own life. There are different sets of arms drawn with the figure, as Emmeline was still deciding which bodily gesture would best express an emotion of utter despair and hopelessness. Presumably, had she lived, she would have settled on a gesture with the arms to complete the composition. But at the time of her death, she was still working on this canvas. But the most important thing to note is this. The painting of the girl on the brink of suicide at a graveyard has absolutely nothing to do with the life, as we see it in the novel, that would have existed around Emmeline when she was alive. Emmeline wasn't trying to capture the authenticity of life as she knew it from her town. She was trying to capture the type of romantic agony she saw expressed in other paintings and in poetry. Listen to this passage and see what Twain, again with humor, is pointing out. Emmeline has been damaged by romanticism because she doesn't even know that interesting moments of life are happening around her, moments that in the hands of other painters and poets could become meaningful paintings and poems. But I reckon that with her disposition, she was having a better time in the graveyard. She was at work on what they said was her greatest picture when she took sick, and every day and night it was her prayer to be allowed to live till she got it done. But she never got the chance. It was a picture of a young woman in a long white dress, standing on the rail of a bridge, all ready to jump off with her hair all down her back, and looking up to the moon with the tears running down her face, and she had two arms folded across her breast, and two arms stretched out in front, and two more reaching up toward the moon. And the idea was to see which pair would look best and then scratch out all the other arms. But as I was saying, she died before she got her mind made up, and now they kept this picture over the head of her bed in her room. And every time her birthday come, they hung flowers on it. Other times, it was hid with a little curtain. The young woman in the picture had a kind of nice, sweet face, but there was so many arms, it made her look too spidery, seemed to me. Most literary novels are about both the telling of a story and the exploration of a set of ideas. Most literary novels explore one set of ideas from the beginning of the story until the end of the book. In some literary novels written in recent years, I'd say that the novel serves the author to convey a message. It's somewhat like how Washington Irving or Nathaniel Hawthorne approached fiction. The story was primarily there to present the author's view on history, politics, culture, or religion. But by the 1840s, with authors like Edgar Allan Poe and Herman Melville, most American fiction had pivoted away from these ideas, so that characterization, plot, language, and setting typically held more importance than an author's discussion of history, politics, culture, or religion. These ideas were still there in the novel, though they were layered into observations that quite often expressed the author's worldview without becoming the subject of the story. Perhaps another way to think of this, I think today, in our highly politicized world, some authors arrange a story as the vehicle to present a message on culture, politics, history, or religion. This is different 
to how Twain and other writers of realism approach the composition of a novel. Twain has an overall experiment. It's clear that he doesn't know the outcome of this experiment when he begins writing. His experiment is this. In the 1840s, how much can a boy raised in a highly racist environment change his beliefs under ideal circumstances? Again, Huck Finn is so deeply steeped in the culture of racism that as the novel starts out, he doesn't even know that his beliefs are racist. They are simply an arrangement of what people in his town, along with Pap, believe. Twain wants to see, in a realistic world, how much Huck can change. When Twain starts writing, he doesn't know the answer. Therefore, he doesn't have a message for his readers when he starts, other than, let's see if we together can better understand how realistic people function and might change in a racist culture. What we typically think of as the themes of Huck Finn are more the intellectual obsessions of Mark Twain as he wrote the book. Mark Twain was deeply interested in the superiority of realism as he wrote the first 16 chapters. But then he took a break of many years from writing the novel, as we talked about in a previous lecture. And when he returned, the ideas that were more central to his outlook were not focused on realism. He was still a realist, but he was interested more in how European culture had slowed America's development into its own country. In this, I might suggest that you don't view this novel, outside of its sensual social experiment with Huck, as a vehicle for Mark Twain to present his views on culture. Rather, I would suggest that you read these passages as something more organic. Because Twain was deeply interested in these ideas, they show up naturally in his writing as part of his personality. For example, if you had a friend who was deeply religious, some of their religious outlook would naturally show up in the stories they told about their own experiences because that is part of their outlook. Something similar is happening here. Some of Twain's outlook on culture is showing up in this novel because this is how he sees the world. He may capitalize on this in a few places in a more knowing way, but overall, characters in this stretch of the book are damaged by their reverence for British or European culture because this is how Twain saw America's recent past. It was also something that irritated him. If imagination is some combination of vision and emotion, then the situations in the middle section of this novel repeatedly seem to be born out of Twain's annoyance as to how deferential Americans were to the culture of a few countries across the Atlantic. In the following passage, Huck and Buck talk about the ongoing feud between the Grangerfords and the Shepherdsons. The two families view this feud through the lens of chivalric honor. That is, a type of honor that relates to how wealthy families in England might live. The term chivalric is usually associated with medieval knights and gentlemen societies. In this, families defend their name for social honor. For certain wealthy families in England, a family's name and honor have material value. The family's name might also be the name of a business, and therefore to damage the family name would be to damage the value of the business, or perhaps more importantly, how much money that business might make. Relatedly, for these same families, to damage their family name might also be to limit their access to political power or social circles, which also has real-world consequences, both in terms of money and opportunity. But what Twain is pointing out here is that it is ridiculous for two middle-class families in the agrarian South to adhere to a chivalric code and arrange a feud for decades simply to defend the honor of their family name, as neither family stands to gain anything of importance if they win. In England, for a family with a large business, the honor of a name might affect their livelihood. Here, for families like the Grangerfords and the Shepherdsons, it affects nothing of material value. Such families would still sell their crops and livestock for the exact same price no matter what happens with this feud. There is no upside for this feud. There is only a downside with a few people killed every year or so. And the only reason that these families are drawn to this feud 
is because of a sense of tradition that relates to upper-class culture in England, a set of cultural circumstances that the Grangerfords and Shepherdsons would have only seen in books. In the following passage, we can see Huck's confusion when the system is explained to him by Buck. Again, as it's set up here, it's played for humor. This is chapter 18. Why, where was you raised before? Don't you know what a feud is? Never heard of it before, Huck said. Tell me about it. Well, says Buck, a feud is this way. A man has a quarrel with another man and kills him. Then that other man's brother kills him. Then the other brothers on both sides go for one another. Then the cousins chip in and by and by everyone's killed off and there ain't no more feud. But it's kind of slow and takes a long time. Has this one been going on long, Buck? Well, I should reckon. It started 30 years ago, or somewheres along there. There was trouble about something, and then a lawsuit to settle it, and the suit went against one of the men, so he up and shot the man that won the suit, which he naturally would do, of course. Anybody would. What was the trouble about, Buck? Land? I reckon maybe. I don't know. Well, who done the shooting? Was it a Grangerford or a Shepherdson? Laws? How do I know? It was so long ago. Even here, you can see Huck trying to make sense of it. He is confused by the idea of family honor, so he thinks that the feud might have something to do with land, as the ownership of land has deep material value. Again, though, that is shrugged off for humor. But later in the chapter, it is no longer humorous. Middle-class American families in the rural South pretending to be wealthy English families has dire consequence in this story. This is what happens, Twain is pointing out, when the people in one country don't accept the reality of their own economic situation and instead pretend to live as though they are actually in a different country. This, too, is from Chapter 18. All of a sudden, bang, bang, bang goes three or four guns. The men slip down through the woods and come in from behind without their horses. The boys jump for the river, both of them hurt. The men run along the bank, shooting at them and singing out, Kill him! Kill him! It made me so sick, I most fell out of the tree. I ain't gonna tell all that happened. It would make me sick again if I was to do that. I wish I had never come ashore that night to see such things. I ain't ever going to get shut of them. Lots of times I dream about them. I stayed in the tree till it begun to get dark, afraid to come down. Sometimes I heard guns way off in the woods, and twice I seen little gangs of men gallop past the log store with guns, so I reckoned the trouble was still going on. I was mighty downhearted, so I made up my mind I would never go near that house again because I reckoned I was to blame somehow. I judged that piece of paper meant that Miss Sophia was to meet Harney somewheres at half past two and run off, and I judged I ought to told her father about that paper and the curious way she acted, and then maybe he would have locked her up, and this awful mess would not never happened. When I got down out of the tree, I crept down along the river a piece and found two bodies laying in the edge of the water and tugged at them till I got them ashore. Then I covered up their faces and got away quick as I could. I cried a little when I was covering up Buck's face, for he was mighty good to me. Just one chapter later, Mark Twain continues his depiction of how Americans are unusually respectful of European culture even when the people making the claim clearly have no background to support such connections. This happens when the king and the duke arrive. Though they are in the novel for hundreds of pages, we never get their names. Once they have their European titles, that's all that really matters. They are, of course, a couple of confidence men, or what we'd now call con men, working their way downriver. The younger one, who is maybe 30 or so years old, has learned at some point that Americans living along the river will treat people who claim to be a British duke particularly well, even if they speak with a Missouri accent. In the 1840s, Americans had no way to know how British pronounce words unless they met someone from England, which was an uncommon occurrence in middle America during this period. The older man... 
people in the novel suggest that he's much older than the Duke, quickly catches on that a claim to a European title can lead to an easy life. So he decides to one-up the Duke and suggests that he is the Dauphin of France. This is the title given to the heir of the throne. Specifically, he claims to be Louis XVII, son of Louis XVI. Louis the Seventeenth was born in 1785, which means that the king in our novel relates to a historical character that would have been about 60 or so years old. The novel has prepared us for this moment back in chapter 14 when Huck and Jim discuss the Dauphine. But this here is an unusual turn to have someone pretending to be the Dauphine. This section not only depicts how deeply Americans imagine their identities as still relating to Europe, it also begins to develop some of the plot elements that will define Huck's journey downriver. Huck wants to find people with whom he can make a new home, but the people he's presented with over and over, aside from Jim, aren't the type of people with whom he can form a meaningful relationship. This is from chapter 19. But the old man got pretty silent by and by, didn't have much to say, and didn't look pretty comfortable over all that petting that was going on around that duke. He seemed to have something on his mind. So along in the afternoon, he says, Looky here, Bilgewater, he says, I'm nation sorry for you, but you ain't the only person that's had troubles like that. No? No, you ain't. You ain't the only person that's been snaked down wrongfully out in a high place. Alas, no, you ain't the only person that's had a secret of his birth. And by jings, he begins to cry. Hold, what do you mean? Bilgewater, can I trust you? Says the old man, still sort of sobbing. Till the bitter death. He took the old man by the hand and squeezed it and says, The secret of your being, speak. Bilgewater, I'm the late Dauphine. You bet Jim and me stared this time. The Duke says, You are what? Yes, my friends, it is too true. Your eyes is looking at this very moment on the poor disappeared Dauphine, Louis the Seventeen, son of Louis the Sixteen, and Marie Antoinette. You? At your age? No, you mean you're the late Charlemagne. You must be six or seven hundred years old at the very least. Trouble has done it, Bilgewater. Trouble has done it. Trouble has brung these gray hairs and this premature balditude. Yes, gentlemen, you see before you, in blue jeans and misery, the wandering exile trampled on and suffering rightful king of France. At this point, their antics and their schemes are humorous, but they'll become more serious and selfish as the novel continues. In chapters 21 and 22... Huck again goes ashore, this time to see events leading up to a murder, and then to watch a lynch party. By this point as well, the novel is developing a subtle morality that is developing between Huck and Jim, one of a building friendship that is in sharp contrast to other people that Huck meets as he moves downriver. In chapter 21, he again sees a culture that is drawn toward violence. Sherburn is a business owner, and Boggs is the town drunk, who has a type of street comedy where he pesters wealthy men in town. Everyone here except Sherburn understands that Boggs is harmless, yet this episode ends in tragedy for Boggs. This is from Chapter 21, and this too is Twain depicting a culture far different from the one Huck would like to find. He don't mean nothing. He's always uh, carrying on like that when he's drunk. He's the best-natured old fool in Arkansas. Never hurt nobody, drunk nor sober. Boggs rode up before the biggest store in town and bent his head down so he could see under the curtain of the awning and yells, Come out here, Sherburn. Come out and meet the man you've swindled. You're the hound I'm after, and I'm going to have you, too. And so he went on, calling Sherburn everything he could lay his tongue to, and the whole street packed with people listening and laughing and going on. By and by, a proud-looking man, about 55, he was a heap the best-dressed man in that town, too, steps out of the store, and the crowd drops back on each side to let him come. He says to Boggs, mighty calm and slow, he says, 
I'm tired of this, but I'll endure it to one o'clock. To one o'clock, mine, no longer. If you open your mouth against me once more after that time, you can't travel so far, but I will find you. In the following chapter, after the tragedy, members of the town go to Lynch Sherburn for his crime, a crime that they have witnessed. There is an early draft of this chapter in which Huck learns that some of Sherburn's friends whisked him away before the mob could arrive. In this version, Huck learns how mobs seek to work outside the law. But before the book was published, Twain revised this chapter. In the revised version, which is in your book, Sherburn isn't whisked away, but instead is at his house to meet the mob face on. And then something unusual happens in the book. Mark Twain allows Sherburn to give a lengthy speech about how he sees the South as a depraved culture, a culture that speaks about virtue but rarely acts on it. So why so late in the writing process did Twain revise this section? Well, he clearly felt this information was important to have in the novel. If nothing else, it spells out the exact trouble that Huck will find as he moves downriver. Huck repeatedly finds people who act cowardly and selfish and with whom he can't be close. But perhaps beyond this, the late edition of Sherburne's speech, particularly with its length, might suggest that this is how Twain, too, feels about the South. This might also be Twain's opinion of the region's shortcomings which create the context for Huck's plot, to see if Huck can find a place here that he can call home. This is from chapter 22, just after the mob arrives at Sherburn's house, and this time hear it more in the author's voice as he talks about how he sees, perhaps, the problems of the South. Then he says, slow and mournful, the idea of you lynching anybody. It's amusing, the idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man. Why, because you're brave enough to tarn feather poor friendless cast out women that come along here. Did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man? Why, a man's safe in the hands of a thousand of your kind, as long as it's daytime and you're not behind him. Do I know you? I know you clear through. was born and raised in the South, and I've lived in the North, so I know the average all around. The average man's a coward. In the North, he lets anybody walk over him that wants to and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it. In the South... One man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot. Your newspapers call you a brave people, so much so you think you are braver than any other people, whereas you're just as brave and no braver. Why don't your juries hang murderers? Because they're afraid the man's friends will shoot them in the back in the dark, and it's just what they would do. So they always acquit. And then a man goes in the night with a hundred masked cowards at his back and lynches the rascal. Your mistake is you didn't bring a man with you. That's one mistake. And the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks. The escapades of the King and Duke begin in a humorous vein even if their schemes are designed to swindle small amounts of money from people they meet. In the novel, we either see or hear about a list of cons perpetrated by them in recent months. The Duke pretends to set up a newspaper. Of course, he has no plans to make an actual paper, but he uses this lie to raise money. The scheme would have gone something like this. The Duke would have told people that he was starting up a town paper. To get the ball rolling, he might have said, if you paid today, you'd get a subscription at a steep discount. Instead of the regular rate of, say, a dollar today and only today, it would be 50 cents. Then he went around to business owners and said something like, usually ads in a paper like this are $2, but today only. As an introductory offer, if you pay now, they're just a dollar. Then he'd take whatever money he had made and leave town. The king has also run a number of scams. Quote, I've done considerable in the doctrine way, he said. I can tell a fortune pretty good. 
But perhaps his most inventive scam was pretending to be a reformed pirate, and then at a church revival meeting, announcing that he was working as a missionary who was willing to return to those pirates he once knew and bring them religion. Then he takes in some charitable donations. When they are together, they rehearse and then perform scenes for Shakespearean plays, or I should say they perform them poorly. But even before reviews are whispered around town, it's very clear that few here want to see highlights from British drama. As Huck put it in chapter 22, quote, So the Duke said these Arkansas lunkheads couldn't come up to Shakespeare. What they wanted was low comedy and maybe something rather worse than low comedy, he reckoned. Then together they put together a show called The Royal Nunsuch, which, as opposed to scenes from Shakespeare, was advertised as a burlesque. At the bottom of the advertising bill was the line, Ladies and children, not admitted. For people in town, this meant that there would be bawdry humor, earthy stories, and maybe even dancing girls. About this, the Duke said, If that line doesn't fetch him, I don't know Arkansas. Again, this is a small-time con operation. People are promised a certain type of show, and then they receive far less. The cost of admission is 50 cents. That would be between 16 and $17 in today's currency. I realize here the multiplier seems small for such a wide expanse of years, a multiplier that is just over 32. But for part of those intervening years, keep in mind, America faced negative inflation such as during the Civil War and during the Depression. So in each of these examples, the people swindled by the King and the Duke are deprived of money. But for the individual swindled, it's a small amount. So are those people who lose 50 cents for the royal nonsuch upset? Well, sure they are. But they still have their houses, they still can feed and clothe themselves. Are those people that subscribe to the Duke's newspaper upset that they never saw a single issue? Well, of course. But again, the amount was small enough so the loss didn't affect anyone's lifestyle. And are those people who donated to the king's fake plans to bring religion to the pirates upset that he never went on his mission? Probably. But if you fell for this plan, the reformed pirate-to-pirate -pirate missionary scheme, then maybe you also learned something about using reasonable judgment. Huck doesn't seem overly bothered by any of these small schemes. But his attitude toward the king and the duke changes when they arrive at the Wilkes Plantation. There, the king and the duke impersonate Harvey and William, distant relatives to three young women who are now on their own. But their schemes at the Wilkes house are not limited to small sums. The king and the duke intend to take all of the family's money. They intend to sell the house and land, along with the furnishings. This will leave those girls destitute. They have no visible means to support themselves once the family land and resources have been sold. Huck begins to intervene, hiding the money to save it for the girls. And then things get significantly worse as he watches the king and the duke sell African-American slaves who have lived alongside the Wilkes family for years. This is from chapter 27. So the next day after the funeral, along about noontime, the girl's joy got the first jolt. Huck then eases his own conscience about what is about to happen by saying that he believed the sale would later be deemed invalid. He points to a money transfer mechanism called three-day drafts, in which money changed hands three days later, and by then Huck was certain the king and the duke would be exposed as frauds, nullifying the agreement. But this doesn't make the situation better in the moment. The African-American family in the moment is still separated with the belief that their separation will be permanent. About the Wilkes women and the people who were being sold, Huck observed that he thought it would break their hearts for grief. They cried around each other and took on so it most made me down sick to see it. The girls said they had never dreamed of seeing the family separated or sold away from the town. I can't ever get it out of my memory. Then he went on to say, and I reckon I couldn't have stood it at all, but would have had a bust out and telling our gang if I hadn't knowed the sale weren't no account. 
There's a couple of important takeaways from this section. First of all, this episode continues the narrative that Huck is unable to find people with whom he might share a new sense of family. What he finds instead repeatedly is selfishness, ignorance, and violence. In terms of the overt plot, the problem is this. Where will Huck find a new home if, in Twain's vision of the South, the culture there is permanently and pervasively damaged? But there is another observation that this novel is beginning to point to as well. During this scene, in which the people most abused by the King and the Duke are the African Americans, who believe they are being separated away from family members, Huck's sympathies are directed more to the Wilkes daughters who are white and whose background more closely matches Huck's own identity and experience. In Mark Twain's Vision of the South, this is one of the central barriers toward reducing racism. At least as Mark Twain constructs the world of this novel, his characters here, during times of trouble, are more easily able to imagine the interior space of those around them whose background and cultural markers are similar to their own. His idea of how humans are constructed is that they more easily develop empathy for people whose past and whose cultural orientation is similar to their own. Huck recognizes that this scene is a tragedy for both those who are being sold and for the Wilkes daughters. He has sympathy for both groups, but he has deeper sympathy, which is expressed through action for those characters whose background and identity is similar to his own. And for Twain's experiment, this is a barrier, perhaps a telling one, that at least in the world of this novel, at least in Mark Twain's perspective, Huck has been conditioned to imagine the interior space of people like himself, which is a barrier for a deeper type of equality. Or to put it another way, even if actions and opportunities in America move toward a type of equality, how then, this novel is starting to consider, do you change people so that they then are able to have deeper empathy, are able to more deeply imagine the interior space of people whose backgrounds and identities are different than their own? And I think that this is also a question that we can explore as a side experiment in our own lives outside of the materials for this class. How accurately are you today able to understand the interior space of those whose background and identity are different than your own? What contributes to a strong understanding and what also limits it? And just as important, how does your ability to deeply imagine or less than deeply imagine the space of others affect the community around you? And lastly, even if we don't presently have the ability to deeply understand the interior space of everyone around us, does simply understanding our limitations make us more effective or kinder members of a community? These are questions that the novel we're reading begins to touch on, questions that begin to ask, how do we improve the world around us? And this also creates a transition to our next lecture, which focuses on the social experiment that is central to the fictional work of Mark Twain's realism. <laughs>